Hi, welcome to this talk on building a social network in under four weeks with serverless and uh, GraphQL. Uh, so recently I worked on a client project where I built the backend for a new social network that lets you, well, mostly university students, uh, register your sporting interests and find other people to do sports with. You can arrange activities like a basketball match and have a group chat and you can also message each other directly to arrange some uh, sporting activities together. So the client is a privately funded uh, bootstrapped startup. Uh, so there's a lot of constraint on money and therefore development time. And they also need to have something in place before the new semester starts or was going to start in uh, September. So from the get-go, I had some pretty clear goals to work with in terms of the help to help me drive the technology decisions and what approach I should make. Uh, we need to maximize the speed of, uh, of development as the client uh, needs to get the app out quickly and can't afford a long development cycle. Uh, but at the same time, they need something that can scale to millions of users if it takes off and they already have agreement with local universities in Belgium to roll it out to tens of thousands of students uh, right away. And this is especially important as the first version of this app that they built with uh, PHP running on, I think, two servers at a time was a disaster and it crashed on launch day. So we can't repeat the same mistake here. And the system needs to be uh, need to require minimum upkeep. Uh, the client just doesn't have the funds to hire a full-time team to look after this. Uh, so the system pretty much have to run itself and uh, not fall under. And it also needs to be cost efficient as well as we, as we scale to hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of users. So the project was put together with a team of uh, three engineers, including myself, uh, where I was working part-time, averaging maybe two to three days a week for the past couple of weeks now, where uh, while also juggling with uh, my responsibilities with other clients as well. And we didn't just build the mobile app. Uh, we also built a CMS for the app as well, which will be used by the founders to onboard new universities and to manage uh, the list of predefined sports that you can select from the app. The CMS also will be used by university staffs to manage their profile on the app and to, I guess, the, uh, categorize and publicize their sporting programs. So I'm not going to show you the full architecture here, but here are just a few of the key components. Uh, we have CloudFront and S3 for image assets and things like that. And for authentication, we use Cognito. Um, there are one Cognito user pool for the mobile app and then also one for the CMS. And as the backend is all done in GraphQL using AWS AppSync, again, one, of the mobile, uh, one for the mobile app and one for the CMS and they each would have uh, resolvers that point to DynamoDB for simple get and put and query operations. And for anything that's more complicated than that, I will have a Lambda function resolver, and that function may also be doing more complex uh, stuff against the DynamoDB tables. I know you can use uh, pipeline resolvers instead of the Lambda functions for most of this, uh, but it's just easier for me to do it with Lambda, and it's easier to hand it off to somebody else later on as well. Uh, and also we use uh, Algolia for search. And Algolia is, is probably the closest thing you'll find uh, to a serverless Elasticsearch. And to get data into the Algolia indices, I use DynamDB streams to trigger Lambda functions to then synchronize the data changes to Algolia whenever say a user creates a, or updates their profiles or when they start a new sporting activity in the app and also capture BI events or business intelligence events from the different Lambda functions and use Firehose delivery stream to buffer and batch them into S3 uh, so we can then run business intelligence uh, 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 reports against them uh, in the, with Athena. Again, this is not an architecture diagram, but it's just a high level summary of the different services I used and how they fit together uh, as a whole. Uh, moving a level up, we have uh, multiple AWS accounts, which is a good security practice and helps limit the blast radius of any security breaches that we may or may not experience. 
and it also gives you a consolidated billing and the billing reports across all the different accounts. I use the AWS organizations for managing these accounts and had four independent uh, organization units or uh, for dev, staging, production, as well as an org unit for accounts that manage shared resources. Uh, for example, there's a shared users account for single sign-on and a shared account for collecting all the, all the information uh, such as CloudTrail logs. And then there's accounts for dev, staging and production. And at the organizational roots, we have a couple of service control policies, for example, to deny access to all services outside of the EU West one region, because I know that's the only region that we're going to use right now. Again, remember all this was done by one person working part-time for a couple of weeks and it's only possible because I could stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, really, all the hard work is done by AWS and the service teams and I can rely on some good tools like the service framework to help me manage and deploy my application. Um, so my name is, is uh, Yen Chui, I'm an AWS Serverless Hero, and I've also been a long time user of AWS as well. I've been running applications at scale on AWS for over 10 years now. And for the last couple of years, I've worked uh, predominantly with uh, serverless technologies. Uh, a couple of years ago, I also worked with another startup uh, where I moved the entire startup to run pretty much, uh, um, sorry, another social network. And a couple of years ago, I also worked on another social network where I um, moved pretty much the entire social network to run on serverless. And nowadays I spend a, a, a half of my time working with Lumigo as a developer advocate. And Lumigo, for those of you who haven't heard about us, we are a, sport, we are a, a serverless um, troubleshooting platform, uh, which makes it really easy for you to troubleshoot uh, problems within your serverless architecture. As you can see, you can visualize the transactions as it goes through different AWS services, and you can also see your Lambda logs side by side as well. The other half of my time, I work as an independent consultant where I work with uh, you know, companies from all around the world in all kinds of different industries, and I help them either um, upskill their teams through training, or sometimes I help them with the architectures uh, through advice and uh, uh, pairing sessions. And occasionally I also take on client projects where I just deliver the application for the, the, for the client, as is the case uh, for this uh, social network that we're talking about today. In my spare time, I also like to put content out there for the community, including lots of blog posts. Uh, my, I've got a new podcast called The Real World Serverless, and also have two uh, books um, with uh, Manning. Uh, well, one of them is a video course, and I also have self-published several of, uh, a couple of uh, video courses as well. And this year, I'm also running some in-person as well as online workshops. Uh, and if you stick around until the end, I will have some discounts for you guys as well. So, um, I'm sure most of you have uh, heard about or know about GraphQL already, so I won't take too much of your time here. Uh, basically, GraphQL is, uh, has got a schema language that lets you define the data types and operations that uh, your API supports, uh, including queries for fetching data, uh, mutations for well, mutating them, and then the, the client will send this query uh, or mutation to a GraphQL server, and Apollo is perhaps the most popular implementation of a GraphQL server. And the server will uh, validate the query against the schema and it will pass it and then it will in turn fetch the data from the different data sources and stitch them together in the format the client has asked for and return that. So think of it as your backend for front end, except you don't have to write bespoke endpoints every time the client wants a, another piece of data or it wants them in a slightly different format. And as for Amazon or AWS AppSync, it's basically a managed GraphQL server which lets you map those queries and mutations operations as well as data types um, to different data sources within your AWS account. And it supports the DynamoDB, uh, Lambda, Aurora, Elasticsearch, as well as HTTP endpoints out of the box. And for example, in this case, as a logged in user, I need to fetch my profile. And in this uh, query operation, 
uh, is able to fetch, I'm able to fetch everything I need, uh, including my ID, first name, last name, gender, and what sport I'm interested in. Uh, these are all mapped to a profile table in DynamoDB. So AppSync would fetch my profile using the authenticated user ID that I got, um, that Cognito has provided to the AppSync backend. Um, but you know, the list of uh, sports in my profile only contains uh, the ID for the uh, for the for the sport because we want to be able to change the display name and image URL for the different sports. So we don't want to bake those into every user profile that references that sport. So we are going to need to expand those and fetch the image URL and display name for each of the sports that I'm interested in. So with, uh, with uh, GraphQL, that's called a nested resolver. And in this case, uh, AppSync can then fetch those information from the sport table in DynamDB. So we're good here. There's no need for the client to send us two separate query requests. Uh, so it saves us some round trip uh, time there. And for my activities, uh, since I can have many, many activities, so when I fetch my profile, I just want to return the first page of it for my next activities. That, uh, that's likely all I'm going to look at in the app. So AppSync can run a query against the activities table where the data is stored against my user ID as the hash key and the timestamp for the activities as range key. So we can easily get pages of activities in descending order. And since other people may also ask to join my basketball match next week, for example, I also need to fetch the request that I have uh, for joining my matches or my mass basketball match or whatever activities I am organizing. Again, we only store the user ID in these requests. So to display this request in the UI, we're also going to need to expand them into those users' uh, public profiles so we can get their names and profile images and so on. And so we have to we have another nested nested resolver that will also get the user profiles from the profile table. As you can see, this is very, very flexible. The client can basically ask for any information they need in one operation. But you can also probably sense the danger here as well, that the client might end up asking for more information uh, and you can have uh, really deeply nested queries that can start to impact performance and your cost. Luckily, you can mitigate some of this by enabling caching, uh, which is supported natively in AppSync. Uh, in this case, it also lets you enable caching on specific resolvers and you can adjust the cache TTL for each of the resolvers. So for things like the sport, which doesn't really change once it's created. So we can have a longer TTL compared to uh, caching someone's uh, public profile. And to prevent further nesting and to prevent also and also to prevent leaking any personal information like uh, date of birth, uh, there's a separate data type for your profile, which only you can fetch and your public profile, which other people can fetch uh, when they try to when they search and find you on the, one of the search results or when they or the, when they want to uh, ask well, when they want to join one of the activities that you're currently planning. So it's a much flatter structure that doesn't allow for much more nesting compared to your personal profile that again, only you can fetch. So one query returns all the information I need for my profile to be displayed. And when you see other people's profile, you're looking at the data that's available through their public profile only. So when I look at somebody else's profile, I won't be able to see the date of birth and other information such as um, uh, what requests they currently have uh, for one of the activities. And until I join the activity, I won't be able to see the members who are part of that activity already. And the app thing itself is very scalable. Their GraphQL, subscription, their GraphQL subscription implementation can support millions of con connected clients. And uh, your AppSync API is deployed to multiple availability zones out of the box, which also gives you a great baseline for your resist uh, for resilience as well. And you only pay for what you use at about $4 per million operations. And as I mentioned earlier, it has built-in support for caching, which charges you extra, uh, especially if you'll be paying for, essentially you'll be paying for uptime for memcached nodes. 
And it also has built-in monitoring and with uh, CloudWatch and CloudWatch logs, uh, where you can get the high-level metrics like the number of API requests you receive, uh, error count, and latency, which is great. But unfortunately, these are all aggregated for the whole API, so it's very difficult to tell which of the resolvers is causing you problems when it comes to latency, for example, since a single query can involve hitting many different resolvers. Um, what you can do in this case is you can enable logging, and then you can also enable more verbose uh, content as well, which tells you the um, the um, information uh, that comes in and out of the mapping as uh, your mapping template. Uh, and also in this case, it gives you more information about what's going on in the inside the resolver, so you can at least narrow down the spe specific request that is taking a longer time to process, and then you can inspect the re the resolver logs uh, for what requests um, for for those requests to figure out uh, you know, what the problem actually is, and. For performance issues like this, it's even better, I think, if you use uh, X-Ray instead by enabling X-Ray tracing, which really shines, uh, shines a light on what's happening under the hood and shows you where the time is being taken. And you can see that for this very simple query, this single query, it has resulted in a mode, quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of different DynamoDB calls uh, behind the scenes. And X-Ray also shows you a service map, so you can get a high level of view of which services your AppSync API is talking to and their overall health as well. Um, and best of all, it gives me all of that and I don't have to manage any servers, which is amazing. So in general, everything has pretty much worked. I find everything has worked as advertised and the documentation is doing a pretty good job, but I did run into a couple of really small things. Uh, for example, I had an issue with the documentation around how to handle conditional check errors with DynamDB resolvers. The documentation was wrong, uh, but it's been raised to the team and the AppSync team is looking into it. So in the meantime, if you need to know what to do, I've got a blog post on just that. And uh, it also wasn't very clear to me how to skip those notable fields with uh, that has got a nested resolver attached. So again, I wrote a blog post on how you can do that. Um, you might have also noticed that I have quite a few Dynam DB tables here, 11 to be precise. And if you've been following what's happening in the sort of Dynam DB space, you might have heard about single table design and wondering why I didn't you know, condense some of these tables into single tables instead. Uh, which often offers you the best performance, scalability, and probably cost as well. But for this app, uh, we don't need to optimize for the best performance and scalability, at least not yet. And the multi-table design would be sufficient, at least for the foreseeable future for this app. And the thing with a single table design is that it is much more complex and it does require a more thorough understanding of how DynamDB works, especially in terms of global cycling index. And now I don't remember who said this, but I prefer to design my systems as if you'll be run by idiots because one day it will be. And most of the time, the idiot is yourself in three months time, uh, where you just can't remember why you did certain things. How does this thing even work? Uh, in a world where most developers are familiar with single table designs, then I would absolutely be very glad to choose single table designs for all the technical benefits that I just mentioned. But until then, I need to do right by the client and build a solution that somebody else can easily pick up and run with it. But as a member of the AWS community, and it's my responsibility to help create that world where single table designs are widely adopted and accepted as well. So I implore you to read about it, to learn about it by starting by watching this session from Rick Houlihan at the reInvent 2019, and also check out Alex Debris' excellent DynamoDB book, uh, which will really help you get the most out of DynamoDB, including many more advanced uh, modeling patterns and uh, many, many uh, trips uh, tips and the tricks as well. And in terms of authentication, as I mentioned earlier, we use a Cognito user pool and I set up a identity federation so the users can also sign in using Facebook and Apple as well. And on the client side, we use the Amplify JS library to integrate with Cognito, which really made things quite simple as far as authentication is concerned. However, 
I didn't use the Amplify CLI to create and configure the Cognito user pool. I did it by hand using CloudFormation because, well, I already didn't know how to do it. And if anything, I kind of want to know how it's been configured so that I get so that it does exactly what I want. And with uh, Amplify CLI evolving very, very quickly, I've also had quite a lot of people you know, report uh, of uh, breaking changes, and that's not something that I'm willing to deal with for a client project where the goal is to be able to hand it off to somebody else later on to continue working on it. And while I think it's a, it's a great tool for quickly bootstrapping a new app, especially for a team that just doesn't have very strong experience with AWS and with Cognito in particular, it, it helps you get start something going very quickly and give you some good defaults. And I've also, but I've also heard that it doesn't cope so well with changes. And a few people have told me that they've had to delete the entire stack and start from scratch when it got stuck and can't deploy some changes. And again, likely because of the fact that it's still a quite young tool and it's still evolving and maturing, uh, but. No, it's not something that I'm willing to deal with for a client project. For a personal project that I'm going to be involved for very long, for much longer than maybe. And also, Amplify can um, sometimes uh, it can also provision and configure down DB tables for you as well, based on your model, uh, and uh, as well as creating AppSync APIs and resolvers. But I don't agree with some of the decisions it takes in terms of uh, using, for example, DynamDB scans for list operations and so on. And in this particular case, the DynamDB schema and access patterns are quite important here with potentially huge scalability and cost implications. So I want tighter controls around those aspects and need to understand my access patterns uh, quite intimately. And also, don't forget, we also built the CMS as well, which also uses the Amplify JS library to authenticate users against the CMS Cognito user pool. And as the uh, as an admin for the app, which will be mostly the two founders, they can onboard the new universities and configure the default list of uh, sports you can see in the app. Uh, but when you onboard a new university, you also need to invite and uh, uh, and admin staff from the university to the CMS as well, uh, whose email you're gonna configure in the this particular screen. And uh, at that point, we are gonna generate a temporary password for them uh, when we register the user in the Cognito user pool and Cognito will send this email uh, password, well, password email to the user uh, and the email is, uh, well, sorry, the, uh, the user is created using a Lambda function behind the CMS app sync, and the user would then be able to come into the CMS, use the temporary password to log in, and then they'll just be asked to update their password on the first sign-in attempt. And then the CMS user we created for them would be added to the university group to identify them as the university admin as opposed to an admin for the entire CMS, which would be the founders. And we also use a custom attribute to tell us which university they are the admin for, which is then passed along to us as in the AppSync API by Cognito when the user interacts with the CMS AppSync API resolvers. Uh, so at no point, does the client does the client pass the university ID to the backend to say, uh, "Hey, I'm the admin for this university. Just trust me and let me access the data." It's always based on your identity. And when you are the admin for university, you have a very different set of options in the CMS, which are limited to just your university. And the nice thing with AppSync is that you can restrict access to operations uh, using Cognito groups which is something that you have to build yourself uh, if you're talking about API Gateway. So in this, in this case, if you are an admin, you'll be able to get university's uh, details by name and you can edit the sports, uh, the list of sports we have in the app and so on. Uh, but if you are the university admin, then you can only fetch and edit information about your university. And if we don't specify any spe uh, specific auth options using the uh, at AWS underscore auth uh, directive, then any logged in user can perform those operations uh, like getting an upload URL for images and such and such. And moving closer to the code, I use the serverless framework to help me uh, package up and uh, deploy my app. 
because it's mature and it has a great community around it and it's extensible through a whole range of plugins from the community and we're going to see two of these uh, in just a minute and I was uh, already you know, very familiar with it. It's been my go-to solution for the last couple of years and I'm really proficient with the serverless framework so it kind of makes sense for me to use it unless something, some other tool has, has some really you know, great um, advantage over it which I didn't find any. And in this particular case, I've got one repo for the whole backend and everything is configured to uh, in, well, in one serverless or YAML and it's deployed as uh, one CloudFormation stack. So resource reference and all of that is uh, was very straightforward even as the project grows and to deploy i had just one command to you know to, to run and then they'll deploy the whole thing and to make it easy for me to configure all these resolvers i have with the two AppSync apis i am so glad that there's this uh, serverless AppSync plugin out there which really made things super simple for me as I mentioned, we have uh, two AppSync APIs, one for the app and one for the CMS. So I broke those out into their own files. So things are a bit more manageable within the server. So YAML, uh, in each one of these files will look something like this, where, I've, uh, where I'm hooking up the, uh, the AppSync API to the correct um, Cognito user pool, and I'm configuring uh, logging, which in production, we don't want to log everything because it generate so much logs uh, in CloudWatch logs, and that has a cost associated with that. So uh, by default, we are gonna uh, log everything in the non-production environment, but in production, we're gonna log uh, only the errors. And then I will configure my resolvers and data sources in the same file. For many of these resolvers, uh, we will be going to down DB directly. So the request and response uh, patterns, or sorry, templates, uh, is gonna be written in the Apache VTO, which is the same templating language that API Gateway uses as well. So I'm kind of familiar with it already. And honestly, the um, official documentation does a pretty good job and gives you a bunch of examples that you can just follow. And most of them looks quite similar anyway. And as the project grew, I also hit the 200 resources limit uh, pretty quickly, actually, uh, since I also tried to follow the principle of uh, least privilege. And I have one IAM role for every single Lambda function. Uh, so I didn't, it didn't take very, very long to get up to uh, 200 resources in this particular project. Uh, luckily, there's the um, split stacks uh, plugin, which can split your one stack into multiple stacks by splitting some resources into uh, nested stacks instead. And the great thing here about this plugin is that it lets you control the splitting logic yourself, which was very handy because uh, remember, I've got two AppSync APIs, each one of them with their own Cognito user pool and its own set of resolvers, and they're pretty much independent from each other. So I wanted to split by the AppSync API, uh, whereby all the shared resources like the DB tables, S3 buckets, and some Lambda functions that are not part of the AppSync APIs, uh, they are in the root stack. Uh, so in this case, I also have some functions that are doing some uh, background data processing to synchronize data uh, in the background to our goal here to a uh, fire host and so on those are all part of the root stack as well or the parent stack and all the functions resolvers then the corresponding iam roles they're all split into the nested stacks as you can see there's a very few there's a quite a few more things in the app um, nested stack for uh, the, the nested stack for the app um, AppSync uh, API for the app uh, compared to the CMS stack. And the great thing about all of this is that I can still reference Dynamic DB tables and other resources in the parent stack in my uh, in the definition for my functions using the same ref and get attribute uh, function uh, pseudo functions as if they are in the same stack because a plugin would fit, would see those and it would instead passes them as parameters to the nested stack. So there was no code change that I uh, required when I had to split up a stack into um, the parent and the nested stacks. Which brings me to CI CD. And uh, since whole, the whole code base was in GitLab already, I decided to just use uh, GitLab CI CD. And the one technique that I've employed in most of my projects is to install the serverless framework as a dev dependency 
which means that I don't have actual dependency on a CI server. And I can add a very really simple helper script to my package.json so that uh, in my when it comes to deploying from a CI, uh, it's literally a two-step thing to run npm CI, which restores the exact versions of my dependencies as they were in the package.json file, and then run npm run SLS. The SLS is a script that we defined uh, earlier here. Deploy um, to trigger deployment using the version of a serverless framework that's been installed in the project. But we still need AWS credentials to run deployment, right? So a pretty common question I get is, uh, how do I secure my CI CD pipelines? And so far, the best approach I've seen is uh, assuming you have multiple AWS accounts um, to have say one for every environment is that uh, you will have a dedicated uh, um, ops account where you uh, you run all of your ops and security monitoring tools there and you have set up a ci user which has no local permission in the account basically a flat out deny on all actions in this uh, ops account where it's declared but then in each of the AWS accounts where you want to deploy stuff into, so those are your destination accounts, you will have a deployer role, which the CI user is allowed to assume. And each of these uh, deployer roles would have a entity trust relationship to the CI user in the ops account so that they can only be assumed by this user and this user only. So even if the credentials for the CI user gets leaked somehow, then the attacker would not be able to do anything in the ops account itself. And in order to do any damage, they would need to know the account ID and the role name for each of the target roles um, that you want to that you want you need to assume into in the first place. This way, you can have a very permissive deployer role and still be safe in your CI pipeline because they can only be assumed by the CI user, which on its own has no permissions whatsoever um, in its own account. But if you want to add another layer of protection, then you can also consider using attribute-based assets control or ABAC, where you can further limit assets to resources by tags, um, but right now, problem is that many of the services that we use just don't support it yet, including Lambda, which is why I, I couldn't use it here. And when it comes to testing, one of the, I guess, challenges with using something like AppSync is that it's basically a black box. So how do you test it locally? There are tools for simulating AppSync locally, but I generally don't bother with them uh, because they don't really cover everything, including IEM permissions. And honestly, those uh, VTL templates uh, are so simple and they just work. Um, where it tends to go wrong is in my Lambda functions where I tend to do more complex things. And so for those, I like to test my integration, my functions uh, integrations with other services like Algolia or DynamDB by executing the function locally, but talking to the real DynamDB tables or the real Algolia indexes. Um, I don't tend to use mocks or stubs or simulate them locally with things like local stack. They take too long to work properly, to configure and work properly, and they're a bit brittle as well. So it's just easier for me to provision the tables and then use them in my integration tests. And then I will, after deployment, I will run the end-to-end -end test that would run user stories, like creating a profile, then search, and then join another user's activity and so on. And I'll run this against the deployed GraphQL endpoints in API Gateway, so AppSync. So this will always run after the deployment. And if you've got any failed end-to-end uh, -end tests, then great, use them as a valuable rehearsal for how to debug real problems in production. If it's difficult, then guess what? You know, that's, that's gonna happen when you, you know, when you do have a problem once, uh, once the system is live. So use this as a signal that you need to improve your logging, how you're monitoring your system, and maybe enable X-ray tracing. If you're struggling to debug failures in a controlled environment like your end-to-end -end tests, then you're gonna have a much bigger problem when this thing is in the wild. So don't optimize for your comfort with those local simulators. Uh, it's, a false, it's, it's gonna give you a false sense of security. And finally, let's talk about the AWS organization setup. So I mentioned that I have several org units uh, in an AWS accounts, and I don't want to manage this by hand. I want infrastructure as code for all this as well. And uh, fortunately, 
there's uh, this tool called the uh, org formation uh, which gives me exactly that and lets me provision and manage my entire AWS organization with infrastructure as code using this uh, yaml like syntax that's very similar to cloud formation um, so this yaml based syntax is very similar to cloud formation and it makes it easy for me to also template my landing zones um, so basically what uh, basic infrastructure should be provisioned to a new account things like uh, KMS encryption keys, uh, VPCs, and things like that. And in this case, I was able to declare a master AWS account and the root for my organization, again, all in code using a syntax that's very similar to CloudFormation. And I'm able to also provision new accounts and set up budget alarms and with just a few lines of code. And I'm able to attach these accounts to org units, which again, is all created and managed in code. And I can also configure service control policies. Uh, here I've got, uh, I know the only region we're gonna use is uh, EU West one. So I can set up a service control policy that denies all actions against regions other than EU West one and apply this policy to the organization at the root. So it applies to all the AWS accounts we have. And I can also configure my password policy for AWS users and use this password policy in all of my uh, policy on all of my um, AWS accounts as well. And whenever I make any changes, I just have to run this one command to update my entire AWS organization. And then to configure my landing zones, I can configure um, what is called a task. Uh, where I can specify a cloud formation template and provide the bindings to my organization, which basically says which resources from the template should be created in which AWS accounts by binding its resource, these resources to org units or to specific accounts that have configured in org formation. And here's an example uh, of one of these templates where I have, um, I have just a normal cloud formation resource for an IAM user and I can bind it to an AWS, um, sorry, organization binding, um, which identifies the, the accounts that it should be deployed into. And down here, I can also iterate through the AWS accounts that are, provis that are provided by uh, the, the another binding. Don't worry about if uh, don't worry about if the, the the mechanics of how this works looks a bit alien to you. Once you spend a bit of time with org formation, it will start to make a lot more sense. But here, I'm basically just saying, okay, iterate through all the different accounts that are bound to this row binding, uh, which can in include a bunch of different uh, AWS accounts uh, that are part of uh, AWS org, org units or org units, um, and then create the resources, uh, basically an array of resources uh, from that. And then to update my landing zone, I just have to run another command, so just one command to do that all. Uh, it's a really powerful tool. So I do recommend that you check it out. It's available from uh, on, on GitHub and it's maintained by MoneyU, uh, which is a, a bank based here in the Netherlands. And that's kind of the three main tools I use in this project. The service framework for deployment automation, AppSync for the managed GraphQL server layer, and org formations for automation around the uh, so org formations for automation around um, AWS organization. And if you go back to the goals that I started with uh, in terms of speed, getting everything done within four weeks is uh, pretty good going, uh, considering then the, you know, the amount of stuff that's involved. And I was working part time on this as well. So speed of development, you no know, check. Uh, AppSync can scale to support millions of users, so absolutely check here. Uh, and I have zero EC2 instances, so no service to manage, and no networking, no VPCs, and none of that. Uh, so minimal upkeep, check. And if you look at the AWS bill for last month across five AWS accounts, it's a measly $5.54, including 20% VAT. And ironically, a lot of the bill goes to having a budget alarms on every single account. Uh, and, and I have also configured a um, uh, customer managed keys in KMS as well. And that's where the $2 come from. And we are not live just yet, but nonetheless, the projected cost for this, uh, uh, based on the cost for AppSync, DB, Lambda function, so on, uh, when we go live with tens of thousands of users, it will still be very small, even if the, everyone uses the app a fair bit. Um, so being cost efficient, check. 
And that brings me to the end of this talk. Thank you guys very much, uh, very much for being with us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I spend most of my time as an independent consultant. So if you want to see how serverless can help your business go faster, or you maybe just need some help upskilling your team, then let me know. Go to theburningmonk.com slash hire me to see how we can work together. And I'm also running some public workshops this year that teaches you everything you need to know to build a production-ready serverless application, which comes in both in-person workshops for small groups, as well as a four-week online workshop, which has just started, and you can still join without missing out on anything. And you can also get 20% off my video courses uh, with this same code I showed you just now as well. Once again, thank you guys very much and uh, stay safe. I'm going to be online for a while to answer your questions. Take care.